Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. I want to welcome regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three reps uh, to the State House from the town of Brattleboro. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Olga. And I want to, for our video viewers, and I'm sorry to our radio listeners for this brief um, sidetrack, but this sheep that I've had behind me, I have been meaning to ask you. In a recent episode, I just have to give a disclaimer. This is not my sheep. (laughs) It's not my house. (laughs) I'm in the state house. I'm in a committee room that was formerly the agriculture committee room. And everything got rearranged because of COVID and air quality. And so there are these sort of random abandoned committee rooms that you can hide in if you have a Zoom meeting to do. Gotcha. And no one really thought about quality backdrop. Or maybe they did, and so they left the sheep up. I don't know. But this is the sheep that has been on the show recently. I, maybe it's Carolyn Partridge's sheep. She's the chair of the Agriculture Committee. I don't know. But it looks like a hand-quilted sheep, which means a lot of craft work. It's actually that. wood. It's a painted oh, it's wood. wood. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, I'm impressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay sorry back to the show well welcome sheep uh glad you've been able to join us all these weeks um so emily i am we're going to talk about a couple things in today's show we're going to start t- uh just touching a little bit on on money uh because everybody's a buzz with the fiscal 23, fiscal year 23 budget, state budget. But then in the second half, we're going to talk about S287, which has to do with school funding. Um, But before we get into that, I was thinking about the state budget. And, you know, this week, there's been a lot of coverage in the news about, um, you know, what budget has this, what budget has that, what the governor likes, what the Senate likes. Um, For those who may not be familiar with how the state budget is built. It goes through a number of processes. Um, So earlier this year, Governor Scott gave his budget address and uh, put forward roughly about a $7.7 billion budget. In March, the House put together its version, uh, about $8.1 billion. And then this week, the Senate, which is why it's in the news, the Senate passed their version of the budget, which was about 8.2 billion. And now it's gonna go through a reconciliation process and then it will go to the governor. More than likely he's gonna veto it and then it will go back and then it will go back. Um, But we'll we'll have something by the new fiscal year. I know people get nervous about that. I don't, I know we'll have something. In Vermont, we always do. Yeah. Um, But it got me thinking about budgets. And since this is a show where we, we talk about the stories that we kind of layer on top of legislative policy. I know we like to think budgets are all about numbers and numbers don't lie and numbers are easy and they're all head, they're no heart. And I think our money bills in some ways have the most stories wrapped up in them. And I know you haven't been directly, directly involved with the fiscal year budget, Um, But I'm curious for you, Emily, when you hear discussions around the budget or when you're considering money bills yourself, what are some of the stories you hear? What are some of the the conversations that happen? Yeah, I want to even back up further about sort of how the stories even get shaped. Mm -hmm. So when the governor puts forward the administration's budget, Um, It has, you know, all this detail in it, but the detail um, all represents policies and programs and theories of change or stories, right? A theory of change is just a story about what will make things better or different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of wrapped up in every line item. But because when it hits the legislature and we're developing our budget, there needs to be a policy that matches up with every single one of those line items. And each Mm -hmm. of those policies, which are sort of abstract stories when they're listed in the budget, 
need to have concrete stories in the form of a bill for most of them, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't just give money to an agency and say like, hey, figure it out. They like do their core duties. And if they're going to do something new, that has a bill attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to pause you there. Is that a Vermont policy? Is that a general practice when it comes to how the whole world works? I, I mean, I honestly, I don't really know how the congressional budget works, but I assume that's how the whole world works. And that's been sort of, that's stood up to me listening to the you know, news coverage of how congressional appropriations work. Mm-hmm. Um, so even like the congressional earmarks that we are um, really experiencing the fruits of in Brattleboro lately and throughout Vermont, but I'm mm-hmm. quite thrilled with them for Brattleboro earmarks. Like those all have like, pretty comprehensive grant proposals connected to them. Yeah. It's not just like people spinning a story. It's like people explaining what they're going to do with the money and how they'll be accountable for it and all of that. And why they need it in the first place. Yeah. And so what needs to happen between like the governor's super surface level story and the house committee and the Senate committees developing their versions of the budget is each of those line items needs to have a fleshed out program attached to it or a fleshed out theory of change attached to it or a story. Um, and the governor's budget often just has the surface story mm-hmm. and they never submit bills or programs connected to that surface story. So one really good example of this is sort of the story around who's investing in housing and how much work, money we're investing in housing. Okay. And every chain, you know, the House, the Senate, and the governor all mm-hmm. want to tell the story that they're doing housing best, right? And mm-hmm. they're the ones who mm-hmm. care about housing, and they're the ones that are investing in housing, and everyone, no one else is investing in housing. And, you know, we, throughout the state, but in Brattleboro, like, are very, very aware of how much we need housing, right? Yep. And we need housing. Hush, hush. Not, not you, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. That's no, okay. Um, and we need housing at sort of all levels of the market. Right. Well, maybe not the very top level of the market. I think we have enough of that. But, mm-hmm. um, but everyone has a different story about like what it means to do that well and what will work. So right. it's not just like how many millions of dollars you pile into housing. That's like who wins the housing contest. I mean, who wins the housing mm-hmm. contest is like, how many millions of dollars you plow in and whether or not that creates the housing that people need, right? Mm-hmm. And whether they can afford it at the end of the, the yes. yes, the housing they, like the housing they need, right? Like mm-hmm. the housing that they can obtain. And that somehow, like when we boil down the budget to just these numbers, who's putting more millions of dollars into it, who actually benefits from that and whether it's sort of an effective use of money towards people's benefit often gets lost in the sound bites of the stories, Hmm. especially when you're able to sort of operate from the administrative sky high view of not actually having to fully develop the policies. You implement the policies once the legislature develops them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think housing is a really good example of this story. So, you know, we knew that there was a broad commitment to spending a lot more money on sort of capital A affordable housing. And when I say capital A affordable, I mean like housing that is technically meets sort of like statutory definitions of affordable, which has all of these um, different other sub definitions connected to it. It's connected to federal definitions, you know, the percentage of the number of people living at different levels of poverty or not poverty that live there. This is sort of, I know this is your day job now, Olga. So like, You know, that's that world. And so like, and we have very clear mechanisms in state government to get money toward that. Um, Mm -hmm. We have the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. We have the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. That is their bread and butter. That's what they do. They do their work through organizations like Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust and Downstreet Housing and Champlain Housing Trust. And like, that all makes sense to them. Yeah, very clear pathways. Very clear pathways. And very clear theories of change that like, you know, if you give these organizations money, they invest in usually rehab of housing that's sort of like at low middle income folks. And they keep houses actually like, you know, single family homes also perpetually affordable. 
they have a very clear theory of change that they've really proven out really works, but not at the scale that we need housing right now. Right. And they can't build the amount of housing we need at the speed we need it, not because of any problems with their business model, just because it's a lot to scale up really fast. Mm -hmm. Well, and also in, in Vermont, we need, you know, if you have enough money that you can build whatever you want, you're, you're probably fine. Mm -hmm. But we need housing that suits income levels across the spectrum. And, um, you know, middle income housing may not necessarily fit into some of the models um, uh, with capital A affordable housing. Uh, and so we still have that Mm -hmm. what's commonly yeah. called the missing middle. So yeah. We and so this missing middle, <laughs> this missing middle, which is like the heart of where a lot of this fighting happens mm -hmm. is the governor put forward funding for what he considered missing middle, which was sort of subsidizing developers to close the gap between how much they would make from investing right. in building new buildings and how much they were spending. But like, there's so many policy questions left at the end of that day. Like, how do you even determine like financially, like what the gap is, for instance, right? And like, are you get, like a big question in state government around incentives to the private sector or like, how do you determine whether or not they would have done the work without the money or would not right. have done the work without the money? And so like, that's considered like legally, that's called the but for clause. <laughs> mm -hmm. But for this investment, the work or the development would have never happened. The dog makes very funny noises, Olga. And I'm in a house where there's no doors to close, so I can't like no. lock her. So we don't want listeners. you to lock pets up just for the podcast. That's okay. No, I don't either. They tend to be happier yes. when they're not. I think actually her little brother, who is a beautiful big black cat, um, is ignoring her and she's trying to get him in here. That is the play. Very strange. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, housing. <laughs> yeah. And so like, just like all these big old policy questions that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. And then the legislature like has this idea dumped in their lap and they're like, okay, how do we solve that problem? Right. Um, and so as we go to solve the problem, there's questions about, and we've talked about this so much. So like, you know, please everyone, if you want to actually have this conversation reference, like the four interviews we've done with Maura Collins at BHFA. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially the question is if we have like capital A affordable housing for like folks who are like, you know, at below near the poverty line. And then we have, if we have enough of that, most of the middle income rentals, like the private sector, regular private sector rentals, we should have more of them and they should be easier to fix up. Like there should be more sort of capacity to fix them up. And so that part of the market should expand. And as we sort of, you know, look at zoning rules and um, sort of building codes and guidelines around that, we should be able to sort of open up the upper tier, like the upper middle tier. And so mm -hmm. we have so many folks that are sitting in housing right now that they don't necessarily want to be living in, but they're holding, right. they don't have somewhere else to move. And so there's questions about like, can we make space on both ends of that? And that's how we free up that housing rather than building more of sort of like a mm -hmm. single family ranch, basically. Right. There's like a lot right. of people who want a single family ranch and there's a lot of people in a single family ranch that don't want to be in it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a theory of change that will build things on either side of that. And that's how we'll open that up. Or there's the theory of change that we would just build that and have more of it. And so those like, big policy questions and theories of change and stories about like what the money should be for, I think it's really lost in the um, sound bites around the budget. But that's one example of so much talking about who cares more about housing, who's investing more in housing. When in fact, I think actually it's pretty awesome that across the board, people are like, yes, we need to spend a lot of this ARPA money and a lot of general fund money on housing this year and into the future. The other thing that's sort of the fighting point on that or the difference point of that is if we're going to give state dollars to the private sector to do this work, what is their obligation to Vermonters after that? And so that's the question of like, how long does something stay affordable or close to affordable? So if we are incentivizing folks to build accessory dwelling units on their houses, 
how long does that have to be an apartment before someone can make it a short-term rental? Cause like, yeah, I don't, I don't want my dollars going to build more short-term mm -hmm. rentals. That's like not mm -hmm. how we make more housing. And so like, mm -hmm. that's the kind of questions. So yeah, that's one example of the budget. And now I'm going to go back to you because I feel like I just went on and on about housing when I was supposed to be talking about the budget. No, no, I think um, that was a great example. And, and what it also brings up for me is um, how often when we talk about policy and the money that should go behind it, I think the, the federal COVID funds are a good example. Um, we, or, or even housing where everyone agrees that we need it, but they don't necessarily agree what that looks like. Or um, when the governor talks about how Vermont needs to be more affordable, mm -hmm. I think most this people- one of our favorites. Yes, that's, I, I, I still, I want, like, I want better definitions of what's affordable. Um, and, and I find it kind of fascinating because on the one hand, I think there is a lot of strength when people from, with very different um, points of view, come together and try to build something. Mm -hmm. I think there's some strength in that because they will see things that others won't. And it just, it's a greater um, process. But at the same time, I do sometimes wish like the governor and the Senate and the house would sit down and say, okay, here are some things when we say affordable, this is what we mean. Yeah. And, and kind of come up with some more common ground. And after the break, I think we're gonna talk about the um, loose definition of equity and what that might mm -hmm. mean in the context of political maneuverings. Um, you know, another really, you know, towards that thread, um, supporting businesses through the pandemic, right? Mm, yeah. What does that mean to everyone? And who's, mm -hmm. you know, is it who's putting more dollars or who's putting more dollars effectively? And so we've talked a lot about this idea that, you know, there's investing in physical infrastructure, which I think there's actually really broad agreement sort of across party and chamber, like this is the time to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fairly straightforward. Um, but then when we talk about investing in social infrastructure so that more Vermonters will sort of have more space to be participating in the workforce or in their families or in their lives or just like, you know, doing it, that is a really significantly different policy decision than giving just sort of like cash giveaways to businesses or paying mm -hmm. people to move here, um, which is somehow still a policy for debate on the table, but we are not gonna get sucked down that terrible wormhole of just silliness. But I think for <laughs> radio listeners, Olga is just making the best face right now. Um, <laughs> But what I think is super duper interesting about that, about that sort of, um, that difference, right? Is that when you invest in people, you're supporting businesses too, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and like, you know, there is sort of like a Reaganomics trickle down theory that when you invest in businesses, you're also investing in people. I feel like that one's been like more disproven in the last mm -hmm. 20 years or so, but you know, we're still, Vermont loves to live in the past a little bit. So, that's like, mm -hmm. that's another, like, that's a place where like everyone can say, can tell the story. Like, you know, we care about people and we care about the economy and we're mm -hmm. spending X number of dollars on the people in the economy. But the policy differences around, you know, um, investing in short-term mm -hmm. leave programs for folks who are, you know, working in COVID positive um, and don't necessarily have sick leave at their jobs. Right. Right. Or, um, building out our social infrastructure or childcare. Um, all of those things are such very different ways of saying that you're investing in the economy than sort of shuffling money out the door to the private sector in ways that the auditor has come back over and over and over again um, and said like, the administration's not doing this very well. Not the best, yeah. Not the best, yeah. So in your committee work, Emily, mm -hmm. when your folks are sitting around the table and they're debating a bill, how 
do you as a committee have a process of saying, okay, let's hear all the different points of view and how do we get to consensus? Like what's, what's that process look like if it, or not? <laughs> so we have um, some like sort of core principles of a good tax system that we work with. And it's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, some committees actually have their like core values written on a whiteboard in their committee room mm -hmm. that are like up there that they reference. Um, we are not one of those committees. Um, not like, we actually don't have a whiteboard anymore because it got replaced by a screen and we all miss it. We talk about the whiteboard a lot, a whiteboard back. But um, so that's sort of core principles of a good tax system are um, for Vermont is progressivity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like a little p progressive, you know, it means that the folks with the greatest capacity to pay are paying, right. you know, people are paying sort of according to um, ability. Simplicity, you want people to be able on some level to penetrate and understand um, why they're giving what they give towards democracy and mm -hmm. um, how much that is. Um, we talk a lot about predictability. Mm. So if we are gonna make a change, um, we tend to, that will impact you know, businesses or people. We make sure that we're building it out enough so that if people need to make plans based on it, they can. Right. Um, and those are sort of, and then, you know, how does this fit into the much larger system? And we think about that a lot because, mm -hmm. you know, a single tax or a single fee does not sit in isolation at all. And mm -hmm. so we look um, at the systemic effects of anything we're doing. So um, on the small scale, so we have sort of our bills that we work on, um, ways and means bills that are about like specifically tax policy. And then we spend a pretty significant amount of our time having other committees bills come through that have a fee attached to them or a permit attached to them, or um, that's sort of the easiest, I don't need to finish that sentence. And when those, <laughs> um, when those bills come through, we are looking at both, like if there's a permit here, that's gonna require some sort of administrative support um, to administer it, the fee is supposed to cover that administrative support. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's a new licensing category that um, the Department of Professional Regulation, the Office of Professional Regulation is gonna administer, mm -hmm. um, say we want, you know, say we were gonna license massage therapists, which we mm -hmm. did recently. Um, the massage therapists need to technically like that whole division should pay for itself. You create a new program mm -hmm. that pays for itself with fees. Mm -hmm. But the Office of Professional Regulation in a very lovely manner, and we very much agree with this, like you don't want to set the fees so that they don't really like match up with the, you know, the salary that someone's going to be making in that profession or mm -hmm. the sort of scale of someone's desire to do something. Yeah. So, you know, um, we have a situation right now with fish and wildlife where the fees connecting to hunting and fishing are not coming anywhere close to covering the cost of the fish right. and wildlife department. And that's because less people before the pandemic were hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. We don't want to raise those fees because that might make even less people hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. And so we have conversations about sort of like, what can the system sustain? What right. is equitable given who's paying this? And so we right. ask a lot of questions about sort of who is paying this fee? Is this like a regular person walking down the street paying this fee? Is this a fee that just gets like bundled by a multinational corporation as part of the cost of doing business in this state? Mm -hmm. And so we ask that question too. Is it a fee that will be passed on likely or is it just a fee that's going to get absorbed? So we have a lot of questions like that. And with taxes, mm -hmm. we do that too. So, you know, Vermont um, has no sales tax on food, really like no sales tax on anything that's considered a basic need. Right. Um, and we do that because we want to make sure we have a tax system where again, like the sort of burden or the opportunity to pay is carried by those who can most do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are sort of the considerations that we take into account when we're doing um, other committees bills.
Interesting. When we're doing our own committee's bills. Um, and then also just like that it makes sense and it works right and all of those things. Um, right. Right. Which is kind of what you need to do with any system because if it doesn't make sense and it's too cumbersome, people will stop using it. And then yeah. you've got a whole other set of problems. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't talk about this last week when we were talking to Judge Durkin, but um, there's this whole concept of billbacks, which is part of something that the Agency of Natural Resources does a lot. Mm -hmm. which is that essentially like if they need to bring in a lot of consultants to cover a review of something, they can charge the person who's sort of seeking the permit for those consultants that they're bringing in, mm -hmm. you know, as a way right. of sort of the initial fee is low, but if this process costs the agency a lot of money, they can sort of um, recoup that. But no one wants to go through a process that they don't know how much it's going to cost. Like that's terrible. Yeah, that's scary, actually, for a yeah, lot of people. Yeah, and so it's like, <laughs> this, um, it's a provision that people toss into bills a lot in order, because it feels like, you know, I think straightforward for the person mm -hmm. who's seeking the revenue. And then when they yeah. come to us, we're like, not predictable, no. And strip it out. And so like, that's the kind of, you know, we think about it from both the strength of the state's coffers mm -hmm. um, and the, our ability to you know, have the appropriations committee have the money that they need to do things, but mm -hmm. also making sure that we're not placing an undue burden, um, either process wise or financially on anyone. And so that's how we think about like those pieces of our work. Um, Interesting, thank you. And so seeking consensus, mm -hmm. right? So today, this morning, we're gonna have a bill about permits for hunting coyotes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Which is super duper controversial. And um, I have a number of family members who are farmers, so I already know what they're going to say. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And there's like all kinds of, and there's like, you know, using dogs to hunt. And I think the coyotes are somehow part of that whole thing. Mm. I like, this is not an issue. I know very much about it. And I have not looked at the bill yet. We're doing it this mm -hmm. morning. But one thing I'm super aware of, and like the piece of this bill that has to do with a fee is like so tiny and so beside the point of the larger policy issue. Mm -hmm. But our committee needs to like vote the bill out affirmatively or not mm -hmm. affirmatively, but like the whole, everyone on the committee votes on the whole bill. We don't just like vote on the three sentences right. that have to do with the fee. And so sometimes we'll get bills like one that's sort of as politically divisive as coyotes. Um, and then, but has this like very, very tiny part for us to interfere with. And so it becomes this really sort of interesting process of like, we don't need consensus here. We just need to like finish up our work and get it out. So we like, we don't spend too long fighting with each other when we have no control. Like it's, it's inappropriate for us to interfere in like the underlying policy issue here. Right, right. It's Which is very you're kind different of... than like, if it's a, you're in a committee that owns, like fully owns a bill, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to sort of find a place where people can know enough that they can vote affirmatively or not but not have it sit so long that it creates division in a committee on an issue that's like not our issue. It's like the $15 mm -hmm. permit for the hunting that's our issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really interesting balance to strike in the committee. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I appreciate you running that down because I know for a lot of people that might just be the sausage making of mm -hmm. um, legislation, but I think in that kind of sausage making, it's some really big important decisions get made. And uh, it determines whether you have a, a breakfast sausage or a, a spicy uh, Italian sausage, or I'm yeah. suddenly all my names of sausages have like flown out of my brain. But yeah. you know and what I'm the, saying. <laughs> yeah, and one of the interesting things like sort of um, as vice chair or as chair, that happens in that process is, so we have all these bills coming through all the time and people who were not able to change things in the policy committee, you know, in sort of the committee of jurisdiction of this bill, the mm -hmm. sort of original, the originating committee of this bill right. are like, hey, can you slide this in? Oh, interesting. And so if, but if I start um, creating a precedent 
of mm-hmm. us like interfering in the core policy issues that have nothing to do with revenue in these bills. That's I have missing. no standing myself when all of the other committee members start trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we would never be able to get, we would basically be like rehashing the entire original policy conversation every single time a bill comes through when almost every bill in the building comes through to us. And so there's not enough time for that, even if we like thought that was a good idea. Right. Um, so that's a really, that's sort of an interesting piece of the, it's like a less sausagey part of the sausage making because it's how we don't add extra spice mm-hmm. to things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Emily, thank you. Uh, We are out of time. We need to hear from some underwriters. But folks, stay with the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, because after the break, we will be talking about S287, which passed yesterday um, and has to do with education funding and equity. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters. I am talking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, a representative from the town of Brattleboro. We were just talking about budgets and stories and policies in the first half. Now we're going to talk about education funding. Um, But before we do that, we have to do our thank you. So I want to thank BCTV for uh, airing the video of this show and uh, remind folks that you can also find us on Apple Podcasts where you can subscribe if you're interested. You can also find us on our Facebook page, Emily's YouTube channel. And Emily, what is it that we remind people of right now? Well, Olga, turns out that the views and opinions expressed here in the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, and not the radio station nor the TV station, nor the streaming service that they might be broadcast on. However, I always add in that part about not the streaming service or the platform, semi-ironically, but probably listeners don't know that I'm being semi-ironic because it's just a little loop inside my own head. So I want to make sure that listeners understand that there is this very weird universe of federal law that holds platforms completely harmless from anything that happens on those platforms. You know, Facebook is sort of the strongest example of that. Mm -hmm. It's true Mm -hmm. for any streaming service or any sort of um, Twitter, social media, anything like Mm -hmm. that, that any of this media sits on. And, but TV stations and radio stations experience a totally different set and newspapers experience a totally separate set of liability under federal law on these issues. And I don't, you know, I think there are a lot of questions about more liability or less liability, but the fact that the two are sitting in, in total, under totally different sets of law is just outrageous. And I, in case listeners, I might, I realize that with my totally internal ironic caveat that I give every week, people might not know and might think that in fact, platforms are, are liable for these things and they're not. Well, it's a great example. It's why on WBEW, we've been told very specifically, don't swear, or it might mess with our um, FCC license. Uh, But yet, if we were just doing this as a podcast, straight to like Apple or Spotify or Google or something like that, let it rip. And I want listeners to know that if we were, we would just let it rip because I think we're both some pretty serious cursors here. And so yeah, we are. it's probably best that we stay on the radio so that we can <laughs> keep it under control a little bit and be appropriate. So we don't make our, our listeners blush all the time. No one, <laughs> no one needs a blushing listener. No. So Emily, tell us about S-287 because this is a, a piece of legislation a long time coming. It sure is. So S-287 is an act relating to improving student equity by adjusting the school funding formula and providing education quality and funding oversight. And the House Ways and Means Committee voted this bill out unanimously yesterday. And it was a long journey to get to that as well as a long journey to get to a unanimous vote. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, Where shall I start? I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, Well, before you even start at the beginning, let's remind folks that we've been talking about this 
funding formula and changing the education funding formula. Um, before the pandemic, we have some shows mm -hmm. about it. So there you go on the Wayback Machine. Yeah, so if folks want to go into the Wayback Machine, um, oh, well, I guess I, I'm going to go into the further Wayback Machine, back to Act 60. And so mm -hmm. as I move up through history, I will flag other times we have had shows about this. How does that sound? That sounds perfect. Great. So when Act 60 passed in the 90s, mm -hmm. which was a... This is a landmark case. A massive change in education funding in Vermont. Mm -hmm. When that happened, um, it happened for a few reasons. So, and issues that we've talked about before. So Vermont has in its constitution an obligation to equitable education. And if folks mm -hmm. want to listen to the constitution, the Vermont constitution again, Olga and I recorded it over Christmas. We also so, recorded Act 60. We or did. no, the Brigham decision. So Brigham I'm going to get to the Brigham decision in a second, Olga. So we read the Vermont Constitution over around Christmas. Folks want to listen to that. Was that over Christmas? Yeah. I thought, or is that August? I thought it was August. We did that in August. And so if folks want to listen to that in August, go for it. Um, but in our Vermont Constitution, we have this right to basically um, an equal education under the law, which is very unusual. Yeah, most states don't have that. And so in the 90s, there was a spate of lawsuits all over the country around the fact that education was funded really, really inequitably. And so communities that have had really high property values were able to raise much more money for their schools than communities with low property values. Because throughout the country, for whatever reason, schools are generally funded through property taxes. So I'm not gonna go into the Wayback Machine to tell you why that's true. So what that means is that in the 90s, these lawsuits are happening all over the country. In Vermont, the lawsuit, sort of the suing folks prevail um, and that Vermont has inequitable education. And that is called the Brigham decision. And the Brigham decision is a very readable court decision that Olga and I read aloud around December. And you can go find that. It's super interesting. Gen genuinely, I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. I know like yeah. I change the laws all day, but I don't usually find them very interesting to read. And this court decision was very interesting to read. Mm -hmm. So one thing that one sort of line from the Brigham decision, which is that education in Vermont is a constitutionally mandated right, and that to keep a democracy competitive and thriving, students must be afforded equal access to all that our education system has to offer. So the court held that in order to fulfill its constitutional obligation, the state must ensure substantial quality of educational opportunity throughout Vermont. So that happened, Brigham decision happened. What happened because of the Brigham decision was Act 60. What Act 60 did, was say that regardless of your individual community's ability to raise revenue from your property tax base, you should have the same sort of ability to raise a dollar as any other community. Mm -hmm. And we did that through two main mechanisms, a joint education fund that everyone pays into, mm -hmm. and then everyone gets out of what they need. So mm -hmm. district, a district raises taxes, and we'll talk about how those taxes are raised in a second, they send all of that money to the, that all that money is owned by the education fund. Right. And then a district warns and votes its budget. If that budget, budget passes for its school district, they get all that money back from the education fund. And that's it. That's sort of how schools are funded in Vermont. It's very, very unusual to do it that way. We do that through that education fund mechanism. And then the other thing that creates all of this sort of equity in ability to raise money is something called the CLA, the common level of appraisal, which essentially creates a situation where um, districts or towns with a lot more capacity to raise or appraise higher values also um, are able to sort of pay into the education fund and districts. It like keeps our, uh, our appraisals sort of even rather than on a town by town basis. Mm -hmm. That's like a whole show to talk about the common level appraisal and might actually be interesting sometime. And maybe we Well, I think given, given the COVID yeah, housing market. Given the COVID it, housing bubble, let's put that on the list. I just so, did, yep. <laughs> great, okay. So we have those things 
there's more, more mechanisms built into that, but essentially all the money goes into the education fund and all the money goes back out to the education fund to communities. And what that meant was that essentially the idea was that a dollar raised in one community sort of equals a dollar raised in another community mm -hmm. towards a school. And that's how your tax rates determined. So the idea was that if you want to spend $100,000 in one community and $100,000 in another community, the tax rate in those two communities would be the same. But not two communities don't necessarily have the same interest in raising $100,000 or in having those tax rates. And so we have more mechanisms built in, like two thirds of Vermonters pay not based on their property tax, but on their income. And so they mm -hmm. might pay a different level, right? And then we have like other mechanisms that if you make less than $40,000 a year, you have like further exemptions to the property tax. But mm -hmm. that's sort of the basic framework. What we did not take into account with Act 60 or really as part of the Brigham decision when you read it, is this idea that different students cost different amounts to educate equitably. Yeah, Which they have different needs that need to be met. They have different needs that need to be met and those different needs cost different amounts of money. Mm -hmm. And so a district where 40% of the kids are living in poverty might need to spend more money than a district where 10% of the kids are living in poverty. Regardless mm -hmm. of the parent's ability to pay taxes, this is about the population that's in the school and those costs that the district doesn't really have control over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that difference in terms of to educate kids is something that we haven't really built into Act 60 or the decision. A lot of schools um, and districts and states sort of cover this difference in the cost of educating students through a weighting formula. And that's weighting W-E-I-G-H-T, like a scale. Most district, most states weight those students as basically sort of like a weight on top of a grant that goes to districts. But we don't send money from the Ed Fund that way. We send money from the Ed Fund based on however much anyone asks for money from the Ed Fund. And so people's sort of connection to the education fund and how much they need to raise at the low, you know, how much they need to raise in terms of their own property tax base is really connected to um, their per pupil spending and to all this other stuff. There were some weights in our education funding formula now, but those weights, like the actual number of the weight were carried over from when we had this foundation formula that had grants attached to it that was used in a totally different way. And so we went from having a weight that was attached to a grant to this weight that's attached to a tax rate. And so the numbers like didn't really slide over and they weren't determined scientifically according to how much more it costs to educate, a, you know, to educate kids in a district that's 40% kids living in poverty compared to a district where 20% of kids are living in poverty. So in Act 173 of, I should definitely know what year that was, but I don't remember right now. It was a few years ago. It was before the pandemic. We commissioned a study that said, okay, we know these weights are wrong. They were fairly arbitrary 20 something years ago. What should the weights be? And we got this study from UVM, um, from the UVM College of Education and um, partner with a researcher from Rutgers. It is called the um, report pupil waiting. I actually I don't think, remember what the report's called all of a sudden. I think it's called the, the report on, on the pupil, pupil waiting formulas. Factors. We call yeah, it the factors. pupil waiting. It's called the pupil waiting factors report. Yeah. And it was um, issued on December 24th, 2019. Merry Christmas. And when the Wayback Machine. Wayback Machine. So it was, and <laughs> we interviewed Professor Tammy Colby about the mm -hmm. pupil waiting factors report. I think that was even before we were doing the videos. I think that's yeah. just an audio recording, but if people want to listen to that. So that was in 2019. When she's was. really, she's really interesting. I enjoyed talking with her. Yeah, yeah, she's great. I've spent so much time talking to her in the last year. Because, <laughs> so that report came out. It said, if we are going to sort of stick to this system of waiting pupils in order to create tax rates for districts, this is what the weight should be. That's what the report said. She answered the question we asked. So then last year, 
we were like, okay, we have this report. We are like sort of stabilized from the pandemic. Maybe what are we going to do with this report? Like we know that we have this like fairly significant inequity around the state with how much it costs to educate kids and what people's tax rates look like. What are we going to do about it? And so we formed the task force on the implementation of the people waiting factors report because there were a lot of unanswered questions because mm -hmm. the report is an academic report and implementing law, two different things. Well, and, and the education formula is the type of thing you change one thing here and it goes ripple, 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 ripple across all parts of Vermont yes. life. Yes. And so, you know, I don't know if anyone like read some good like chaos theory pop science books in the early 90s, but I sure did. <laughs> and my favorite one is the butterfly flapping its wings and like how all the weather changes all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that is how our education fund works. Because before the break, I talked about like sort of the core values of a good of a good tax system. Mm -hmm. And I talked about simplicity and equity. Those are always two hard things to balance with each other, simplicity and equity. Because usually yeah. you need to sort of add extra math to get equity. And extra math means not simplicity. When we talk about our education finance system in Vermont, we add a third leg to the dog. And that third leg is local control. Mm -hmm. And so when we have local control, simplicity becomes even more important because we have local voters making local decisions. We need them to have clear, good information to make those decisions with. Yeah. And equity becomes even more important because we wind up even more subject to sort of demographic decision making and cultural decision making and all of those mm -hmm. things. And so those sort of three legs, simplicity, equity, and local control become the three legs of a dog that can sometimes run really fast and sometimes falls over. Maybe it should be a three-legged goat. I don't know. So, I, well, you, you know me, my brain's going like, so what happened to the dog's fourth leg? <laughs> Sorry, I, there's the, I don't think the dog ever had a fourth leg. I think it was born you can't let my three. imagination go too far there, Emily. Yeah, the dog was only born with three legs or the sheep because we have the sheep behind me. Anyway, so we, Essentially, the task force was formed to say, okay, we have this report that has a bunch of recommendations, but some of the recommendations even say, if you're, for instance, one recommendation is to move from the way we measure poverty under current law to a different way of measuring poverty. Mm -hmm. That was one of the recommendations in the report. But if you do that, then all of the math in the report needs to be redone. Mm, right. So like, that's, that's just like one tiny example of like what it means to implement a scientific paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... We had the task force and the implementation of people winning factors report. We met for six months, multiple times a month. Um, we came out, I was one of the co-chairs with Senator Ruth Hardy from Addison County. We did a show on what we were doing at some point in the middle of that. Yeah. And then we came out with a report um, right around Christmas again of this last year, 2021, that said, okay, here's how we need to change some of the math. Here's how we need to change the way we measure poverty. Um, here's how we need to think about a few of these other things. And it's possible that the idea of weighting equalized pupils for the purpose of calculating a tax rate isn't actually an appropriate way to use weighting in our current system. But mm -hmm. this is kind of a revolutionary idea and we're not sure we're right. So if we do want to just keep on sticking with the weights under our current system, here's what the weights should be based on the fact that we need to change the way we measure poverty and we need to add instead of multiplying and like a bunch of other things like that. And so the task force came out with this report with two possible tracks right. um, and like a whole bunch of other very important contextual information about how to do this well, given that it's a pandemic and schools and administrators are under significant stress right now. Mm -hmm. So we came out with that report, huge overhaul of our education funding system in either case. And so the House Ways and Means Committee has been working since the second week in the session to get our heads around what does this all mean? Because what I was not clear enough about when I talked about those weights that were recommended mm -hmm. is they are so large compared to what we are doing in current law that we are absolutely like creating a sea change in, district, in district's capacity to raise revenue. Yeah. At the scale that we really change things under Act 60. And I want to be clear about that. So even 
would sticking with the existing system of weighting pupils in order to calculate a tax rate, we are creating massive seismic changes in our education finance system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that because we believe that all Vermont's kids are our kids and that all Vermont's kids have a right to an equal opportunity under the law. Yeah. Core Vermont value, core Vermont tax value, core Vermont piece of our constitutional history here. So the committee spent the last four months wrestling with this issue. Should we change the formula? Should we stick to the current formula? If we do stick to the current formula, how do we make this transition in a way that Vermont communities can make the most of the opportunities that they have available mm -hmm. to them? Well, and I can imagine there's a very practical question too of how do we implement these changes without, you know, if you have a, a district that's been maybe not paying a lot of taxes into the ed fund and that suddenly jumps, you know, you don't, you don't want to send people into to shock either. No. And create, no. Cyst, you know, things that they're like, we don't know how we're going to do this. Yes. And so we spent these five months doing it. Um, there was a lot it's an incredibly complicated formula. It's incredibly complicated. The issue, the, you know, the report we mm -hmm. published in December is like 80 something pages long. The original people waiting factors report is hundred something pages long. Mm -hmm. The bill that we passed out is only 44 pages long. So we're like making progress. Um, <laughs> it down. But that's just because it has statutory references that aren't in the bill. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason it's so short. And so it was this really, really interesting process that I would actually love to talk about more on a different show about what it means to communicate really complicated tax policy to the field mm. in a time of a really high stress environment. Mm -hmm. And so what we came to um, in the end is that too much change is really, really hard for the field mm -hmm. um, and really hard for communities. We need to really like, you know, stagger one change at a time. That's mm -hmm. really important that we implement these new weights for the purposes of greater equity in our system. Mm -hmm. And we can take our time understanding like what might be the problems in using weights in our system? And are there other ways that we can correct for those problems that will create greater equity for everyone? So mm -hmm. one piece of that is we're weighting things, but we're weighting things on a variable base. Mm -hmm. okay. because every community gets to pick what their base is. And so if a community has a base that's less than an adequate equitable amount to educate a kid, even if they have a weight on top of that, it's still not enough to meet the sort of educational needs of that kid. Mm -hmm. And other districts might be spending well in excess of that. And we're mm -hmm. all sort of paying for all of those things through our joint education spending. Right. And so that's one of the questions that we're gonna sort of carry forward to wrestle with next year. So we have solved this problem of like, how do we redistribute this money so that all of Vermont's kids can begin to have their needs met in their districts financially? Mm -hmm. And then sort of the next step is to say, like, what does it mean to sort of now that we've identified some of these challenges, what does it mean to fix those, like the idea of the variable base? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are. Um, it was a really both like politically complex, socially complex and fiscally complex issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like I could talk about it for six more hours, Olga. <laughs> and we only have five more minutes. Yeah. So I just, um, there was a lot in there. So I just want to sort of parse things out for, for listeners. Um, to clarify, S-287, did it pass out of your committee yesterday or did it pass the House? Um, it passed out of our committee yesterday. It's in the Appropriations Committee now. There's mm -hmm. um, a few positions and a few studies in it um, to support the Agency of Education to do this work really well. Mm -hmm. And so it needs to spend a moment in appropriations and then um, it should come to the house floor next week. And then it's, you know, it passed the Senate about a month ago and okay. two weeks ago, I have no idea about time anymore, but it passed the Senate already. And mm -hmm. so we will, you know, send it back to the Senate sometime next week and um, then either go to a committee of conference to resolve the differences, or maybe they will just accept and we will start implementing this in mm -hmm. FY25. F, that okay that was my next question which is the school year 24 25 which is not all that far away mm -hmm. and um what are if this passes as it stands now 
and the Senate and House don't change too much. Um, what would kind of be the first part to be implemented? So the first part to be implemented um, is some of those studies to examine the other issues. And then okay. um, this new universal income form that we'd be using, which is a way of measuring poverty that will be much more consistent geographically and oh. much easier for districts and parents to administer and deal with. And then mm -hmm. once we have an adequate measure of poverty, then we're sort of ready to you know, move all this tax capacity around based on poverty numbers. There's mm -hmm. also um, some really significant supports pedagogically for English learners. Yeah. Properly. Now, if I remember correctly, um, at least in the, the original study that UVM and, and Rutgers did, there was, uh, they looked at poverty. Um, I can just give you the list and spare yeah. you this. Is that okay? Okay. Sure. So, you mean um, spare you this because you yeah. know it so well. Yeah. So in the original study and absolutely the weights that we carried over um, and are in the bill, it's um, poverty, English learners, middle school, high school, um, rurality, and small schools. And so mm -hmm. a district that's sparsely populated costs more to educate their students and a small school in a district that is sparsely populated costs more to educate their students. A small school in a district that is not sparsely populated does not cost more to educate their students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are, it's those weights. We also have weights in current law for pre-K, which mm -hmm. were not in the study for whatever reason, I was not there when the study was commissioned. Um, and so we are gonna work on that piece this summer um, as part of another study. There's also some questions about how CTE early college and um, dual enrollment are sort of mm -hmm. counted for high school students. And so we're oh, right. also, there's a study to keep on exploring that. But those are the basic five weights that we're talking about. Okay. And they've all moved into this next bill. They have and all moved into this bill. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just before we, we head out here and we do our toast, anything else you just want to make sure listeners understand before... I would just, um, you know, there were a lot of spreadsheets running around the internet when we were doing our work and, you know, we, we were taking the journey to come to consensus together as a committee. Mm -hmm. And so really encourage folks to reach out and be curious about what our work looked like and where we wound up. Um, because sometimes the process looks different from the outside um, yeah. than maybe it was. And so really like want to help people find the right spreadsheets. Um, or answer their questions as we're working on this. Fantastic, thank you, Emily. So what do you think, Emily? Should we, should we toast to stories and how they build policy? Yes, toast to the stories that guide us because we are humans. We are, and we are story-seeking beings. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Hey, thank you everyone for tuning in today, whether you tuned in on the radio or BCTV or one of our streaming platforms. It's always lovely to spend an hour with you. We will be back next week um, and looking forward to it. Emily, if folks want to find more information on you, folks where can they can always go to emilycornheiser.org where they will find links to all of the other things. And as always, you can find us on our uh, the Montpelier Happy Hour at captivate.fm as our Facebook page, The Montpelier Happy Hour. And you can also email us at the Montpelier Happy Hour at gmail.com. See you next week, everyone. Bye, Olga. Bye.